These primitives have no conception of good and evil, have no understanding of the dangers of chaos, and certainly have not heard of the man-god Sigma. Instead, they embrace the primal forces of nature, seeing spirits in all things. The blasphemous gods of the north are their masters, twisting and turning their forms, deluding themselves into believing the failures of their flesh are actually boons, gifts of the dark gods themselves. So when the demons sound the trumpets of war, it is these violent tribes who answer its call. Kurgan is a term used to describe a race of mighty, nomadic, copper-skinned horse warriors who dwell under the shadow of chaos in the vast eastern steppes that border the chaos wastes. The very term is derived from the burial mounds raised by the Scythian horse warriors of old from whom both the Kurgan and their traditional foes, the Gospodorin, descend, and the Kurgan have thus come to be known by the name, for it is said that they desire to bury the peoples of the south in similar such hills. In the old world, there's much confusion as to who and what the Kurgan are. Some believe they are a breed of mutants, closer to beastmen than to humans. Others believe that they are a race of superhumans, being huge, muscular, and all warriors. Others still believe, and these are especially those who have survived a raid, suspect that they are not human at all, being demons trapped in the flesh of men. The fact of the matter is simple. The Kurgan reputation stems from those who have encountered the warbands, or encountered those that have encountered the warbands, that descend from the eastern steppes to harvest slaves and destroy the works of civilization. Since old worlders only ever encounter these people as antagonists, they believe that the entire race consists of nothing more than bellicose brutes bent on raping and plunder. In truth, the Kurgan have as much of a complex and rich culture as anyone else. They are deeply spiritual people, seeing the works of their gods in all such things. From the whispers on the wind to the swaying grasses of the steppe. Theirs are dynamic gods, beings who keep the world in its natural state, being one of the constant change and perpetual flux. Everything is in the process of becoming. Thus, mutation is not an affliction, but rather an evolution of divine will made manifest in the flesh. When a mortal gains some change in his form, he is said to be favoured by the tribal god and is accorded a place of special status. To hasten these changes, many Kurgan bind the heads of their children so that they grow oddly, being elongated and malformed. Since the body is the physical expression of divine will, the Kurgan place special emphasis on strength and mastery of the physical form. In the very distant past, most if not all of the Northmen's ancestors were descended from humans who ventured northward during humanity's earlier migration. Whilst the more civilized tribes colonized the lands of Tilea, Istalia, and the border princes, some of these tribes continued northward until they'd reached the frozen tundras that separate the rolling plains of the eastern steppes from the frozen wastelands of the Chaos Waste, as we call it. Being in such close proximity to the northern warp gates, it was inevitable that in time the dark gods began to slowly corrupt and enslave the minds of these northern human tribes. Those that did not bend to the dark gods had since fled southwards, such as the people of the Gospodor and the Ungol, who themselves were once tribes living within the eastern steppes. Those that remained eventually grew ever more warlike, forsaking the benefits of civilization and instead transforming themselves into the ultimate warriors. 
The resulting centuries of chaos influence eventually led to widespread mutation and social stagnation, while the people of the South developed into powerful, semi-unified nations, the people of the North still regress into primitive savagery, living within isolated tribes scattered all across the Northlands. However, the centuries of harsh living within an even harsher landscape have since bred the Northmen into unparalleled warriors whose swollen frame and large stature made them stand far taller than even the most powerfully built warriors of the South. Before the raising of the great bastion of Cathay, or even the rise of hammer-handed Sigmar in the verdant lands of the Reich, it is said that in their vast lands in the east, the Kurgan had established an empire whose dominion spanned the length of the mighty steppes and ranged yet further afield. An empire of swift horsemen, snarling beasts, and dread sorceries that cut down their foes far swifter than any arrow, and whose warriors' blades were ever wetted with blood. So mighty was this empire bereft of fortress or border that its ruler was known simply as the Great Kurgan, the mightiest warlord his people had ever known, for his dominion was but an extension of his bloody will. By war and conquest, the Great Kurgan gathered all the warlike tribes who bore his name under his yoke. Those who opposed him, he destroyed. Those who prostrated before him, he enslaved. For only the mighty would he allow to dwell amongst his ranks. With a never-ending hunger for power over the steppelands and their people, the great Kurgan prayed to the myriad gods of his people. He prayed to the winds of the north, south, west, and east. He prayed to earth, and sky, and rain, by day to the sun, and by night to the moon, giving up great offerings of slaves, and plunder to curry their favor. The great Kurgan was mighty, but he was wise enough to know that the dark gods of the uttermost north were the mightiest above all, and so in pact with the chaos gods did the great Kurgan pledge himself and his race, in fulsome service, and swore before the gods that he would never falter in his dues to them. The great Kurgan had taken many wives from amongst the clans, but they had only borne him four sons, four brothers who were rivals to each other, and for their father's favour and the glory of conquest itself. Sons whom their father had, in his greed, pledged to the four great gods. In the legends of the stepsmen, it is said that the great Kurgan drew his sons to his side after gaining victory in a great battle. There, within his gur, the warlord spoke of the favor that he had been granted, and how by the grace of the gods he had been allowed to forge the Kurgan peoples into a mighty empire driving before them the hosts of man, orc, and dwarf to ruin. With this, his sons roared their battle cries and boasted of how they would expand their father's domain yet further and spill the blood of his foes. Yet the chieftain also spoke of how there are debts that not even a king can afford to pay and how it pleases the gods to take from a man that which he loves above all. In great despair did the mighty Tsar fall to his knees as the children of the dark powers began to walk amongst his people, driving many to the darkest depths of insanity and debased obeisance. Within his tent, the myriad prophecies and battle honors of the great Kurgan were cast contemptuously down, and the dark gods did take from the great Kurgan, that which he treasured the most. His four sons, taken screaming from their father's city, each transfigured with the stigmatas of the dark gods. Korn, gore-clad lord of battle, Slanesh, prince of fell pleasures, Nurgle, 
corrupt father of plagues, and Zench, the changer of ways. With his beloved sons taken from him, the great Kurgan withheld his tears, and instead raised his skull chalice in thanksgiving to his masters, though he knew well now that every victory he would attain from henceforth would ring hollow, and every joy would turn to ashes in his mouth. The bargain complete, the feckle gods grew bored with the great Kurgan's exploits, turning their attentions to their other servants, and met the great Kurgan's prayers with cold silence. Though still mighty beyond all reckoning, a shade of ill omen followed the warlord closely. His subjects whispered dark things in his passing, and warriors began to offer sacrifices in the hopes of avoiding his fate. Soon, with no bloodline to follow him, his lords gave in to cruel games of politicking, each vying for greater power and glory and rulership of the empire. Thus it was that the great Kurgan saw his mighty empire, which he won through strength and cunning, fall from within, thanks to the quarrelsome nature of his own people. All glory it once had, now ground to dust and forgotten. When finally the great Kurgan fell in battle, none would speak of his fate, and so it was that he became all but forgotten, a fireside legend amongst the men of the north. As the centuries passed, many warlords rose in the steppes, claiming descent from this legendary father of the Kurgan people, but none could ever hope to match the legendary strength of this ancient warrior king. The Kurgan are a people of mystery and fear, a savage race that rides such fleet steeds as to allow them to fly across the land as fast as birds. Their domains lie far from our borders, and yet their speed of movement is such that one can never be sure where or when their next attack shall fall. Those few cartographers who recognize the Kurgan's existence do co-sign them to a far corner of the map. But in fact their territory far outstrips that of any other human realm. Indeed, all the land that we call our own up to the World's Edge Mountains would fit many times within the area that they control. The eastern steppes are massive plains with seemingly endless stretches of dry, treeless grassland, which lie beyond the great mountain range known as the Mountains of Morn. They are bordered by the freezing wastes of the north, by a great desert to the south, and the mighty lands of Cathay far to the east. Over this vast territory there are many tribes, both of humans and other races, but of the northern areas that lie within the Umbra, the Kurgan are undisputed masters. In truth, however, not even this expanse gives the proper extent to their dominion, for the Kurgan recognize no borders or boundaries, except perhaps for the ultimate frontier at the north. No obstacle can stop them. Their driven mounts carry them like the wind over high mountains, great deserts and gushing rivers. They travel where they will, and there are few indeed who would dare to oppose them traveling anywhere. The Kurgan live in tribal families, much like the Norskans, but these are not settled towns or villages, but rather traveling groups that wander the vastness of the steppes and the wastes with their livestock. They are led by chieftains who claim a special connection with their gods, who dictate to them the direction they ride. They travel with their entire families, so that it is literally the case for many of them to be born in the saddle. Most of these show some taint of chaos upon them, whether it be benign or otherwise, and these marks are flaunted and displayed with pride as a sign of their blessing. Many of them go further and try to make their children even more grotesque by binding their skulls while young so that their heads grow in the long and thin manner so distinctive of their people. Though many may write names of certain tribes on a map, 
This will not only give the narrowest indication of their true extent and location, but completely give the wrong impression to one who wishes to learn about the Kurgan, for in the vastness of the steppe there are no confinements, and far greater reliance is placed on the kin band that the Norsemen ride in rather than their greater tribal name. To an extent, a Kurgan's tribe is those people with whom he travels, no matter their origins, and his prosperity and property is what he carries with him. His land is wherever he finds himself. The Kurgans almost invariably travel on horseback, some with wagons to carry tents and altars, and others not. There are a few groups who do not ride, who choose to either wander on foot, possibly because they have lost their mounts through some ailment or accident, or who have permanently settled in some forsaken spot. Why they would choose to completely alter their way of life in such a manner is unknown. Perhaps there is something of significance to the site. It is not completely unheard of for a tribe to seize and settle the land it has attacked, and even, even, even sometimes attempt to defend it, while they wrest riches from the earth. Most, though, are almost constantly on the move, either along age-old routes between summer and winter lands, or seemingly at random across the steppe. It is this fluidity that allows them the greatest favour when shadow creeps out and the dark legions march forth. It is the Kurgan that are the most willing and able to join these cursed crusades, for they are able to bring to bear each and every one of their race. For them there is nothing but advantage in attaching themselves to a larger horde, for they may ride ahead as scouts and take the easiest of the plunder, and when the horde is inevitably reversed or gain-stayed, they can always escape the forces of retribution that move against them. In this way, the tribes of the horsemen may follow these hordes and then find themselves far from where they began when eventually they strike out on their own. Thus, they may be found all around the known world. These ravagers lie, not contained in distant lands to be dealt with by stranger folk, hardier than most. Rather, they may come to any town, any door, even while blinkered folk slumber in their false security. No border, no castle, no country can be a defence against the horsemen of the Shadowlands, for they care for none of them. They will move at will across the plains and hills and rivers. No barrier can withstand them, no levied troops restrain them. For our armies are snails and slugs that must drag themselves forwards, and may fight only where its foe proves willing. The horsemen have no honour, no courage, and they will never meet our forces straight on in decisive battle, but flee when confronted by men of metal, and only turn to strike and slaughter against the weak, the innocent, and the ill-prepared. Though there are differences between each of the tribes, most notably the god whom they serve, they all value strength over any other virtue. They are a people of hardened warriors. Courage, skill, and brawn are their celebrated traits. The most powerful warrior of the tribe is called the Tsar, their name for the chieftain and an imitation of the Tsars of Kislev. He holds his position by dint of his power, the favour of his divine master, and the loyalty of his warriors, which he earns by bestowing onto them gifts for their service. Facial scarring is the clearest sign of Azar's ability, and once a battle is won, the shaman, a chaos sorcerer, makes an incision on the leader's cheek. Beneath the Tsar are his bold and savage warriors that live to fight. After each battle, the Tsar distributes the spoils amongst his warriors, and those who have his favour receive the best rewards. Gold, silver, and other precious metals are melted down and formed into arm rings. 
he with the most rings has achieved the most victories, and is greatly respected and feared by the rest of his tribe. When not waging war, the warriors serve the rest of the tribe as hunters. They ride off to the steppes and bring down antelope and wild cattle to feed the rest of the tribe. This is also an opportunity for a warrior to prove himself to his kin, and oftentimes spawns and other creatures are brought back for great feasts. Not only do these efforts feed the tribe, but they also keep the warrior's skills sharp for when he is ready to battle. The Kurgan are nomadic. They prowl the eastern steppes, following the herds for food. They have no sense of a permanent home since the world is ever-changing, and so they are content to wander and live off the land. A common mistake made by most Old Worlders is to lump the Kurgan into one group, and it's easy to make this mistake since the Kurgan are constantly on the move. In truth, the people named the Kurgan are several independent tribes with no fealty owed to any one chieftain or any concept of a nation. They war with Kurgan and non-Kurgan alike, fighting each other in brutal wars to the point of extinction, much as they do when they raid Kislev, Norska, and the Empire. Although there are countless tribes, the most famous include the Kveligs, Gahars, Tarmaks, Hastlings, Hokmars, Yusak, Kazags, Avags, Dolgans, and the Terrible Kull. The Kurgan are also notorious slavers. As part of the battle spoils, they collect the survivors and tattoo them on the face with the marks of a particular czar. The ink used almost always includes some amount of warp zone to start the mutation process and to dissolve the slave's previous loyalties. A slave is considered an investment. The czar must feed and clothe his slaves, keeping them healthy and hale enough to serve him. In exchange for his efforts, he expects the slaves to fight. Rival tribes will pit their slaves against each other in fighting rings. Since they harvest slaves from the same places, it is also common to have former comrades fight each other in bloody death matches. Those who win these contests are accorded more freedoms and greater status and those with continued success can throw off the shackles of slavery to become a full member of the tribe, possibly even displacing the Tsar himself. Possibly. As the gods are very active in the lives of Kurgan people, their servants have incredible influence on the tribe. The shamans attach themselves to warlords, who have great success in battle, in a sense wedding themselves to a czar. But to gain the service of one of these sorcerers is a sign of great favor by the gods. Shamans conduct rituals, cast spells, and use foul sorcery to aid the warband in its forays against the hated empire. Kurgan tribes dedicated to the Skull King have little use for magic, and therefore slay these sorcerers wherever they are found. Women occupy a strange place in the Kurgan tribe, a place of eugenic enhancement. As a people, there is no concept of marriage, only of breeding. A woman selects her mates based on his fame and his prominence on the battlefield. Women who birth sons of great warriors are accorded a special place in the tribe, whilst those who content themselves with the weak and the unsuccessful warriors are shunned until their sons prove themselves to elevate the status of the family. Though the men provide much of the food, the women also harvest from the steppes. Each day is spent gathering grains to grind into flour, and other foods culled from the flora as they pass through the land. At the end of the day, the women scatter seeds to replenish what they have taken for when they next pass through the land. The Kurgan venerate the ruinous powers. They see these gods as aspects of the natural world. A stroke of lightning will be the will of Char, the changer of ways, whilst an outbreak of sickness 
is the blessing of Nigelin, father of plagues. Every stone, every plant, and the very clouds that float through the skies hold the secrets of gods. No one ruinous power holds more sway than the rest. An individual tribe may uphold a single god, or even a pair of them. Some tribes venerate all four, and throw in a few fresh gods as well. Generally speaking, the Kurgan know the ruinous powers by the names of Korn, Loesh, for Slanesh, Neglin for Nurgle, and Char for Zench. For the Kurgan, it is their duty to wage war, for war brings about the greatest change of them all, death. Such forays are opportunities for plunder, to advance one's position within his tribe, or even to gain the favour of the Dark Gods. Further west, the Kull, Dolgans, and the Hastlings regularly harass the Kislev, sending raiders through the High Pass to savage the settlements scattered in the shadows of the mountains. The rest of the tribes conduct nearly constant warfare amongst themselves, stealing each other's women and supplies until some other tribe returns the favour. Even though raiding is a large part of Kurgan life, many make forays into the Chaos Wastes where they hunt for flesh or prove their might to their infernal masters. Living a life of constant battle makes this people especially hardy and dangerous. Warfare is a cornerstone of their beliefs, and they see death in battle as the ultimate expression of divine glory. When the armies of Chaos gather in the north, the tribes of Kurgan will always respond. They abandon their herding grounds and take up arms alongside the swollen hordes of demons and mutants in their crusade to wipe out the old world. This willingness not only stems from their sense of duty to the Dark Gods, but also because such wars are greatly advantageous. The destruction of an enemy city gives the Kurgan access to more resources and keeps their own population in check. When the war winds down, the Kurgan are just as quick to break off from the Horde to settle in their newfound land. If anything, the Kurgan are thorough in the slaughter of their enemy. They butcher anyone who thinks to stand against them, and pursue those who flee to the ends of the earth. Any survivors... Those who don't succumb to their injuries face a life of misery and slavery. At the end of every battle, the Kurgan divide the spoils and pile their kills on great pyres that burn for days. When the flames die down, they use their slaves to search for the skulls, which they pile into mounds. The Kurgan with the most skulls, and who piles them the fastest, is accorded a great honor a scar on his cheek to mark his victory.